I'd like to welcome the panelists up onto the stage as well, if you wouldn't mind. This is Governor Bill Ritter, of, former Governor Bill Ritter of, New, of Colorado. Former, former Governor uh, of New Mexico, Bill Richardson. And Jack Gerard, uh, the CEO of the American Petroleum Institute. Gentlemen, if you'll join me. So uh, first, thank you all for joining me today. This, uh, this panel, I think, is kind of, I, I view this as the, as the dream panel. And so I'm very privileged to be honored, uh, privileged to be on the stage with these, with these gentlemen. Uh, in fact, I think I'm the only person on this stage who hasn't either served as Secretary of the Energy or been at one time uh, written about in the press as a possible for that role. So we really have some of the three big thinkers here uh, in, uh, in policy for the US. Um, I know you all have uh, biographies uh, in your, your book, so I'm not going to go into great, de great detail on who each of them are. But uh, just very quickly, um, Governor Ritter uh, served as governor of Colorado and uh, for one term uh, and is now the head of, a, of uh, the Colorado State University uh, Center uh, that's focused on clean energy policy. Uh, governor Richardson, uh, among other things, uh, served as a United States ambassador to the United Nations. And of course, I'm incredibly tempted to try and ask him what the heck is going on in North Korea today, although we're going to try and stay focused on, on energy. Uh, he also served as a member of Congress uh, from New Mexico, Governor of New Mexico, and of course, Secretary of Energy for the United States. Uh, Jack Gerard is the head of the American Petroleum Institute, uh, has held similar pos uh, positions with the uh, um, with the American mining, uh, sorry, with the American mining work, so not my American mining workers, but the American Mining Inst uh, Association as well, among others, uh, and is a longtime veteran of Washington, one of the true experts on policy as well. Um, I think what's exciting about this panel is it brings together some pretty diverse views, and I'm hoping that from today we have an open discussion about where the U.S. is, is in terms of competitiveness. Clearly, there was no consensus on the issue of clean energy competitiveness among all of you. I doubt there is here uh, either, um, but I want to talk even more broadly about energy sort of writ large. And so w with that in mind, I would just I would turn it straight to, to Governor Ritter and say, you know, within the context of where we're looking over the next 50 years, how, how do you define uh, competitiveness for the U.S. in the energy sphere, and, and how are we doing? So um, I'd say this is this terrific opportunity for the United States of America to sort of capture uh, the global space here. Um, but we have a variety of things we have to do in order for us to really get there. And one of the things I would advocate for, at the center, we work with states on state policy. We do some federal work. I'm also working with the Advanced Energy Economy group that's sponsoring this, and, and we're really looking at the business case for this, but um, we're not, I'd say we're not doing real well right now because what's lacking is a national energy strategy that really speaks to you know, clean, affordable, reliable energy, and, and asking the question, how do you marry a national strategy with concerns that we have that are environmental concerns, but, but clearly what's lacking, I think, is a national strategy that gives investors, as Michael said, some level of security, some level of confidence that there's investor security um, and, and that you can actually invest in this and you'll uh, make a return on it. There is, at the state level, a variety of powerful things that have happened over the past four or five years, and there are states that are great examples of how to do this, the kinds of policy certainty that can be there, the kinds of financing structure that can help, but, but what's necessary on our part as a nation is to have a national strategy that, in fact, is a clean energy 21st strategy and that uh, sort of examines the things that Michael was talking about in terms of optionality and resilience and says, how do we incent those things in a way that makes a true difference in how we deliver power in America, but then how do we export those things so that we can look at ourselves and say we're a net exporter of clean energy technology and of clean energy innovation and we're making money on this globally. Uh, Governor Richardson, same question to you. I mean, how, how, how are we looking, the U.S., in terms of competitiveness on the energy, energy sphere? I mean, I think you could make a pretty good case that we've, we've increased our production in oil and gas in, in a tremendous way in the last you know, several years. Um, but put that in a larger context uh, for us. Well, I would, uh, I would agree with my colleague from the West, Colorado, New Mexico. Uh, I would also add that some of the most innovative energy renewable uh, fossil fuel initiatives have come from the West, and it's been states, not the federal government. That's point number one. Point number two, I, I'm hopeful, 
uh, I agree that we don't have a national energy stat strategy. We don't have a comprehensive energy policy. My hope is that after immigration and sequestration and the budget, we, we go forth strongly with, with a comprehensive energy policy. Uh, I believe that uh, we've been very lucky. When I was energy secretary, the price of oil was $9 a barrel. We had no homegrown industries. This was in the late 2000s. This is before Jack. Jack's a young guy. There used to be a guy named Red. What was Red's last name? Kaveny. Kaveny. And we used to discuss these issues. But what's happened since? An unprecedented boom in domestic natural gas, uh, which I think is, is, is positive. Uh, the growth of a renewable industry. And so I think our competitiveness position because of natural causes is good. The IEA report by 2020, the United States, the largest oil and gas producer in the world surpassing Saudi Arabia, but mainly because of energy efficiency initiatives that are happening at the private level, at the state level, at the federal level. These incentives are, are, are giving us a sense of energy sustainability. But in the competitiveness front, what do we need to do? One, uh, I think it's important to develop uh, soundly, uh, environmentally sound way, our, our domestic uh, natural gas. I'm for LNG exports. I think it's good trade policy, good environmental policy, lowers the price of domestic natural gas. I think we have to pursue that in a sensible way, strategically. But at the same time, I think renewables, I, I, I don't know if I, 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 saw, I saw that statistic that it's gonna be 1%. I, I don't think that's the case. I think what I see is, uh, if you look at the 100 and, 97 countries that are registered as nations in the United Nations. About 148 have said renewable energy is gonna be our number one energy policy. So that's a pretty strong number. And I see domestic natural gas, uh, gas being a bridge to renewables. I think if we follow that strategy and develop our our resources, our, 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 our oil and gas production sensibly in public lands, private lands. If we pursue uh, an all of the above strategy, which I think makes sense, I think nuclear has a role. They have to get out of the sand and, and start, you know, not just lamenting their, their state after Fukushima. Uh, I think renewables uh, and, and natural gas and, 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 and all kinds and, and energy efficiency measures. I think we're basically in good shape. I know everybody wants, likes to be a pessimist, but I'm afraid right now with our potential energy development, we gotta make the right choices. We're, we're in pretty good shape. I'm gonna come back in, in a moment to what all of the above actually <clears throat> means because it's become sort of a, a set of consensus words within Washington, but I'm not sure everybody has the same idea in mind when they use those terms. So we'll come back to that in just a moment. But Jack, your thoughts on um, competitiveness, and the governor certainly um, raised the, the possibility of optimism for once about energy. Do you, do you generally agree with that? Well, we, we share the broad optimism. In fact, I think the governors have both touched on a key word here, and that is opportunity. And the previous speaker, Michael, I think he was quoting a world uh, energy economist when he said we're at a time of unprecedented uncertainty. I'd convert that to say in the United States we're at a time of unprecedented opportunity in the energy realm. Back to what Governor Richardson just said, and we talk about the all of the above, and that'd be a good conversation to try to define that a little further. But if you look at where we are today, I don't think anyone even five years ago would have predicted the opportunities we have today. When we see it from a broader energy standpoint, we believe in a true all of the above, where fossil fuels will continue to play a key role, just as Michael pointed out earlier. And when you look at that equation, you look at what's taking place in the country today, a true all of the above with more energy efficiency, more renewables alternatives, you know, oil and gas, nuclear, and the list goes on, gives us a chance to literally change the geopolitical dynamic and to move to create the United States, if you will, almost as the epicenter of energy in the world. And all we have to do is to look at the opportunities before us today and what impacts they've already had. Four key points I'd mention. First is, and that signs of our challenges today, it's a job creator. These are good jobs. It's what the public wants. It's what the public needs. Secondarily, it generates a lot of revenue to federal, state, local governments at a the time they need it most. 
the oil and gas industry contributes $86 million a day to the federal government. The third aspect was touched on earlier is our energy security. What does this mean for us to be able to produce our own, if you will, and potentially export it, as the governor talked about? And the fourth one we shouldn't overlook, particularly in the context of the vision of this conference, is the environmental impact. Carbon emissions in the United States today are at 1994 levels, primarily because of increased natural gas production and use of natural gas and electricity generation. So it's a huge opportunity for us, and if we seize that in a realistic all of the above, I think 10 years from now we'll look back and see this as a major turning point in the energy equation of the world. Um, and, and first of all, Val, panelists, please feel free to jump in on any of these if you have any comments. But I guess I want to come back on all of the above because, uh, as I said, it, it seems to be that that used to be articulated as Republican strategy. Now we certainly hear it from Democrats and Republicans. As, as it, but all of the above strikes me. It doesn't happen automatically. Um, you know, if we leave the market just to, uh, to, to its whims, which, yes, we'll continue to get lots of additional natural gas production, but will we get renewables? Will we get some of the other technologies developed that have to come online? I guess, Governor Ritter, if you would start in terms of what's your, as we try to put, drill down a little more carefully on what that actually means, how do you make that actually happen from a policy perspective? Not only does it not happen on itself, it's not happening, right? It's a, there's a big argument. There's, there's enormous policy policy debates and two sides kind of get locked in against each other and we wind up being stalemated. I mean, if an all of the above strategy were as easy as it sounds, then we wouldn't have the kind of, I think, stalemating on energy policy that uh, Senator Murkowski sort of is hoping to get by after you listened to her comments yesterday. But, you know, uh, we do a lot on the rulemaking side around natural gas and so it's important, I think, from an all of the above strategy to understand if... Uh, the fossil fuel industries are going to be a part of that, then, then rulemaking is a part of it because I think an all of the above strategy should be oriented around the things that we say at AEE, right? That it's affordable, and certainly natural gas is passing that test at the time being, that it's, that it's reliable and that it's clean. And, you know, there's a variety of issues around hydraulic fracturing and fugitive methanes, and a lot of people trying to figure it out. We're among them at Colorado State University, but we think that that's a part of it, and, and so... If that's it, then what you'd like is the fossil fuel industry to be able to support other clean, reliable, um, and affordable energy industries that um, actually you find they're sometimes at loggerheads, right? And so, so the all of the above strategy should be oriented around what can spur economic development, what can solve environmental challenges that we have, what's domestic energy, and what protects ratepayers. And if we take those four sort of value propositions and say, now we're going to test an all of the above strategy against them, there are going to be some winners and losers. The strategy itself is technology neutral, but there will be winners and losers depending upon what protects ratepayers, what happens to the environment, what really creates jobs and what doesn't, and what's domestic energy. Uh, and to Governor Richardson, I mean, but, but and that all sounds great, but isn't there to some degree, isn't this to some degree a zero-sum game in the sense that, you know, we have seen energy consumption in the U.S. decline. Um, we, if the CAFE standards continue, we'll see oil consumption potentially, uh, you know, level and decline. Are there not actually less opportunities for producers of energy uh, now and going forward, and thus, um, inevitably, it does set up a conflict between the different uh, sources of generation? Yeah, I, I would agree with your statement. You know, one thing I didn't mention is an, another reason why I'm optimistic is our technology uh, innovation. You know, when I went to North Korea with Eric Schmidt at Google, he was a rock star. All the internet stuff he had, Google. I mean, this was a, the most repressed society in the world, excited. And, and that's where I think we have the advantage in the innovative energy field. Now. I'll go industry by industry, and, and I'm not necessarily picking winners and losers, but all of the above strategy, I think the president's policy is sensible. This is what our policy is. We give everybody a shot. But, but I'm not sure the industries involved are reacting in a way to take advantage of, of not just government policies, but market conditions, environmental trends. I think oil and gas, good shape. I agree with the Governor Ritter. Uh, you know, just right in this, I think it's this hotel. All these hotels in New York look the same. But I remember uh, I, I did a conference with Governor uh, Cuomo on energy. 
And we couldn't get out of the hall because there were demonstrators on fracking. They wouldn't let us out. I mean, if you said the word fracking, they'd throw things at you. Nonetheless, I think oil, natural gas development in this country, I think those industries are moving forward. Uh, they're adapting. Uh, nuclear, I mentioned, you know, with Fukushima is a great hit. It, it was a huge hit. Europe, uh, Asia, I don't know if they can recover. I think they can because nuclear power is basically doesn't emit greenhouse gas emissions. And I think if they get into new technologies and, and find ways to overcome this uh, situation that, that was caused in Japan, I think there'll be a little rebirth in the future. Uh, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, all of that I think is booming. That's coming from natural causes, the private sector on its own, government policies, you see it everywhere. I mean, I, talking to truck companies uh, yesterday, the, they were every, the word sustainability was the third word in their vocabulary. I mean, in terms of, in terms of waste, in terms of uh, landfills, everybody's into this. The coal industry, coal is where I'm concerned. I'm not sure the clean coal technology is being embraced enough by the coal industry. I, I see them kind of getting their heads in the sand, and it's an important source. It's 20%, or maybe it's a little higher. And I, so the all of the above hopefully would include coal, but I'm not sure that the coal guys are adapting. I mean, I'm being honest. Uh, the other industries is I'm, solar renewables. You know, there's been a, uh, with Solyndra, with all the problems, technology, uh, I still think it's an enormously viable industry, advances in, in smart grid, advances in photovoltaic technology, advances across the board, the wind extension happened. Uh, biofuels, biodiesel, you go to Latin America, biofuels, biodiesels is all over the place. Uh, I think for our region, uh, Mexico, Canada, you go to your base, you go to where your strongest America. And I think there's a real renaissance of energy development and cooperation in Mexico. I don't think Venezuela is gonna be as bad as it was, but I think our own hemisphere, Canada, Colombia, I think we should take more of an advantage. Jack, your comments, I mean, on this question of zero sum, certainly the, the oil industry, uh, I think, is facing some, some <coughs> questions along these very lines. Certainly, uh, there's been the issue with the biofuels mandates, and then there's also the question of whether simply uh, by, by law under the CAFE standards, you know, uh, the, the, the amount of oil demanded by the U.S. market will decrease. Now, yeah. granted, Oil is a global market. There are opportunities outside the United States as well. But just your thoughts on how these, um, you know, how these various uh, sectors compete in, in, from a policy well, perspective. And, and Ethan, when we look at the changes that have occurred just over the past couple of years in the United States, our consumption is on a downward trend, and that comes back to the biofuels mandate and some others because we were expecting this large increase in consumption over time, and that has turned the corner now, particularly in the mobile sources and the liquid fuels that we that we're in the space of a lot. And, and those are positive trends. So when we look at a true all of the above, I think we reflect back a little bit and realize we're making progress. We're probably not where everybody would like to be. You look at energy efficiency, for example. Today, the average American uses about half as much energy for the same amount of GDP as they did in 1980. So we're not perfect in energy efficiency, but I think there's also a couple of myths around the all of the above we need to dispel. And the one of them is that it really is a zero-sum game to some extent, and that is, as you think about the potential opportunities, the oil and natural gas industry are major investors in alternative renewable forms of energy. A lot of people believe, well, it's us versus them, et cetera, and that's just not true. If you look at history and research and development from 2000 to 2010, the oil and natural gas industry invested $71 billion dollars to find low emitting or zero carbon emitting technologies. During that same window of time, the federal government invested 43 billion, about half of what we did. The rest of the industry outside the oil and gas invested about 74 billion. So you see that there are a lot of resources trying to capture a true diverse all of the above strategy. But it really comes back to, as the governor's talked about, technology. 
You can't through government mandate force dramatic breakthroughs in technology unless we can develop those technologies. So we've got to be mindful of those timelines. We look at it today in the context of the renewable fuels mandate, right? We're talking about by today we're supposed to have X million gallons of advanced biofuels. It's not there yet because of the technology. Now, that doesn't mean we stop. It means we have to be realistic in those glide paths and say, how quick can we get to these technologies and what can we do with government, particularly in basic science and research, not picking winners and losers, not selecting one or the other, but develop that foundation of knowledge and understanding to really move us into a more diverse, greater opportunity as a country. But I guess on that, that point, just on a specifically on next-gen biofuels, I guess I would ask, how would you, how could you develop a new industry in that sector if you don't have, if you were to remove, you know, all, and, I, and I'm not, certainly not defending the incredibly, uh, let's say, overly ambitious goals of the current policy, um, but how would you develop an industry if you don't have that kind of, incentive mandate out there uh, to develop these. These are incredibly uh, expensive plants to build the first one of. Yeah. You need to have some kind of policy driver. Well, in, in that context, Ethan, I think it's a, an important nuance or distinction here. It, it, there is an appropriate role for the government to decide we need to look at this basic research and to promote that type of activity. Where we get into trouble is where we start picking individual companies or individual technologies. But to encourage the development of advancement in energy sciences and others, we're big proponents of. We don't oppose the activities of the government when it goes out and says, you know, we ought to try to help this industry. We should provide a production tax credit for the wind industry. We, we take no position on that because our view is if that's good governmental policy for society to get us to a diverse all the above strategy, that's an appropriate role. Where we do take issue is where they try to narrow the game and say, well, we're gonna go penalize the oil and gas sector and take money from them and go over here and subsidize some other activity, that's the step too far. So there's a balance here, and I think some of the myths created in our society and the energy economy is somehow that we're all at loggerheads. I think there is a mutual or a shared vision of all of the above that allows everybody to participate and grow. Well, I guess along this, those, along those very lines, go ahead. I mean, you know, as a governor, you, you wind up having this kind of a conversation, and this isn't trying to pick any kind of a direct bite with Jack, but there were a lot of people who came in and said, you can't do mandates, you know, you can't do a renewable energy standard in Colorado. So the people put one on the ballot for 10%, we went to 20%, we went to 30% for a renewable energy standard. We kept having people tell us, you can't get there. And in fact, we're getting there. The price of wind has come down in such a significant yep. way. The price of power is actually going to be cheaper relative to the rest of the country in Colorado. We created jobs as a result of it, brought bestest wind systems in. And so I, I agree about this, you know, like the production tax credit in the wind industry. There's probably a better way to manage that. We think in terms of tax credits, and this is some of the thinking at the advanced energy economy folks, we think that they, a tax credit ought to spur innovation, but when you're there and when you're stable and when you're a mature yeah. sector, that it ought to sunset, that it ought to provide investor certainty the way we think about uh, you know Absolutely. investment policy. And at the end of the day, that, um, that it needs to go away once it's no longer sort of necessary to do that, but in the meantime, it provides a certain amount of reliability. And you saw this with the production tax credit possibly going away. The wind industry that was burgeoning in a lot of places, including in the West, where Bill and I are from, it, it went dormant for a year. And so there's a, there are better ways to manage this, I Absolutely. think, than through fiscal policy. But the fact of the matter is we're not, we're not doing that, and we need to... You know, we need to find ways, and, and yesterday Lisa Murkowski talked about the master limited partnership, letting the, the wind folks or the solar folks be able to participate the way the oil and gas industry participates in that, and that'd be a great thing to get done. Mm -hmm. Actually, well, I sort of want to ask Jack then on that very question. This is a perfect example. MLPs, those are investment vehicles that the oil and gas industry yeah. have had access to for a number of years, allows you to raise money and essentially have single taxation where dividends are passed on to the shareholders. Those kinds of tax vehicles have not been you know, available to renewable energy projects. As, as the governor alluded to yesterday, Senator Murkowski announced her, that she was supportive of a bill to expand that. This is a case of a benefit that, would, that oil and gas enjoys being expanded to renewables. Are you supportive of that? Absolutely. In fact, I got the question in a public hearing a few weeks ago on that very point. I think to the governor's point, I don't think I disagree with anything the governor said. 
MLP is a perfect example. We've looked at it from our industry perspective. It's a good investment vehicle or means to bring capital to the marketplace to develop the energy resource. If that would assist with some of the other alternative renewables forms, terrific. That's the type of kind of generic governmental policy where you try to facilitate the development of energy that we think is very appropriate. And we don't have a problem with that at all. I think the, the point that I just wanted to make maybe is that mandates do have a place. They do have a role. Uh, because and one of the things that I hear when I travel around states is people saying, I'm opposed to a mandate. And actually, it's mandates in some respects, as long as they're not too ambitious, and as long as you can find a way to make sure they're affordable and put in sort of ratepayer protections that have caused a, a really a pull into the industries uh, that we're talking about, the clean industries, they've been sort of pulled into the market through mandates, and it has caused actually technology advancements to happen. And, and so I, I just think we have to be careful about um, looking at the role of a mandate, not being too ambitious, but also understanding that there are 220 million Americans who live in a state with a renewable energy standard, about 240 million Americans live in a state with an energy efficiency resource standard, and those standards have been powerful tools even in economic development for those states. You know, I, I think what we're getting into is a debate on the role of government. And I know most of you here probably aren't going to agree with what I say, but I think the role of government when it comes to energy, when it comes to energy incentives and energy development, it, it's, it should be a catalyst, it should be an incentivizer, it should not over-regulate, it, it should not block sensible energy development. But at the same time, I think you do want some incentives and standards and mandates What's wrong with the renewable portfolio standard that every state should adopt? I think that's going to encourage uh, renewable energy development. I think that is healthy. But there isn't one in this country. Each state kind of moved on its own. We, we were always trying to compete with Colorado and others who has a higher one and in the Northeast at the same way. It's, it's evolutionary. It's happening. Uh, secondly, I, I do commend what Jack said. Uh, the big oil and gas companies are investing in renewable, but I think what would accelerate a broader energy mix and broader energy security, Jack, is if you guys do more, if you invest more, and, and I commend you in, in many renewable energy areas in Africa and Asia and Latin, you guys are there, that's good. But I think as, 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 as leaders in the industry, if you invest more in, 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 in renewables, if you invest more uh, in, in refining, if you invest more in, in these new technologies, I think we'd, we'd be better off. My last, my last point is that I still think we will all be better off if the Congress and the administration, you know, get rid of this partisanship that is so rampant and come up with an energy strategy that addresses what we just discussed in the all of the above area, not the main reason for developing uh, new energy policies, but, but sets up a framework. My, my last point, fracking. This is gonna be a continuous debate. You want in the industry, natural, you want standards on fracking. You don't wanna just let it go wild. You'll get so many lawsuits, people will stop it. I think we wanna work together to get the stakeholders and, and science. Let science decide what is the most sensible way to, to regulate. Let EPA and the states and the industry and universities develop some standards. But you hear this debate, I go around, some in the industry, I haven't heard Jack say this, say, you know, leave us alone, We're, you're screwing everything up, you're doing it again, we can do it. No, there's gotta be some balance and this is where the essential role of government hmm. should play. Ethan, let me just respond to what the governor said, which is a, is a good point. From the industry perspective, a lot of people don't realize the API that I represent today started in 1990 here in New York and was originally created as a standard-setting organization. And today we have over 500 standards. We've just developed five new standards as a result of the hydraulic fracturing technologies and the fast pace with which this technology is moving. That is, by and large, the gold standard. And as Governor Ritter knows, working with the states out there, the states have stepped forward. Colorado's a leader in this. Governor Hickenlooper out there is a geologist. Gets this, he understands it. Uh, Governor Ritter's been working with them, Governor Corbett, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere. 
And those standards become part of the overall regulatory regime as you figure out a way to have a rigorous regulatory activity, back to the governor's point, without shutting down the activity. And that's very important. We welcome that rigorous regulation so we know what the rules of the road are. We have certainty, but you've got to balance that to make sure it's, it accomplishes its purpose and doesn't kill the underlying activity that you're trying to With achieve. With gas, do we run a risk, though, in the U.S. of, of, of a sort of shifting our portfolio too heavily in that direction? I, I, you know, we've gone from about 22% of power generation about five years ago to about 31% last year, a real sharp jump. Um, points all well taken about the fact that there are you know, more policies being written and asking on disclosure, but you know, the, the, the opponents of fracking would say there's still really some open questions about the harm that this could cause to watersheds and things like that. What if we get so far down this road and then we have, a, a, you know, some kind of, I don't know what it is, some kind of disaster that raises real questions about this and we've now invested this tremendous amount um, in this resource, perhaps at the expense of others? I think for a few reasons we shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket. I mean, we've tried that before in a variety of different ways, and it winds up being problematic. So I think Jack's right. We regulate it, regulate it in a fairly significant way, but understand that we are best off if we're diverse. You know, I was meeting with Governor Perry in Texas, and they have an adequacy of resource problem. Even though they're, you know, a big natural gas state, they still could have rolling blackouts this summer because they've got an adequacy of resource. And so for them to think about, you know, ROI, they should be investing in distributed generation in microgrids. They should be looking at all these ways that they're actually able to provide power at peak for you know, the same cost, that if you tier the cost, that peak power is going to be, and you don't have to build peaking plants to do it. You can do it through a variety of other technologies, but solar uh, distributed generation is one of them. And, and that's the way I think we have to think about this, that, that natural gas is this really important part of our merging toward this clean energy future, but we, we got to be very careful about relying on a natural gas strategy exclusive of all these other things that can... They can um, solve reliability issues, adequacy of resource issues, and environmental issues as well. Jake. Well, I was just going to comment, uh, and, and I don't disagree with the governor on that. The other point we should remember, though, is the market has brought us where we are today. It brought natural gas from $14 to $3, which, which has made it so competitive. And in that context, whatever that balance might be, remember coal had about 50% of the production until this started to occur and natural gas started to displace some of the coal burn in the country due to its clean nature and due to its affordability and reliability. Let me go back to the hydraulic fracture. I guess just the one point though, isn't part of the phase out of coal has also been driven by policy as well, right? Yeah, no doubt. Governmental policy has a big impact there and so I think it's a combination of marketplace and regulatory activity, particularly in this administration which has not had a real favorable view of, of the coal burn. Let me just make one quick comment about hydraulic fracturing, if I can. And, and this gets back to let's get anchored in the facts and the science of the conversation. The, the technology of hydraulic fracturing has been around for over 65 years. I thought it was interesting that the new Secretary of Interior, Secretary Jewell, mentioned in her early career that she actually fracked wells when she was with the oil industry for a year and a half or two years. This technology has been improved and developed over time now to where we combine it with horizontal drilling. And in that 65 years, we've drilled over 1.2 million wells with it. There has never been a case of groundwater contamination as a result of hydraulic fracturing. Now that's Lisa Jackson's testimony, the administrator of the EPA in the Obama administration before Congress. I just want to remind folks of that because there's a lot of scare conversation going on but this is a proven technique and a proven technology. Now that doesn't mean we don't regulate, as was talked about earlier, as these technologies advance, as we're drilling more wells, as we're producing more natural gas and more oil with the technology, there's an appropriate role for a regulator to create certainty, to make sure we protect the environment, the workforce, and others. But it is a proven technology, and through that technological development, it has really given us this breakthrough opportunity right here in the United States to to change the geopolitical dynamic. Governor Richardson, I think we're almost out of time. Do you have any last words? You no, want no, I, I was first, so they followed me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to just thank my panel. It's been a very interesting discussion, and actually, I think um, 
I felt like I heard a few points of consensus, which I was, which was very pleasing. Let's see if I had to sum up one on MLPs uh, as a potential vehicle uh, uh, for, for clean energy investment. Um, and two, um, uh, no one's terrified of natural gas on this panel, I think, is, is a safe consensus and the view that it can be, and there's a view that it can play an important role in terms of US energy competitiveness. So I'd like, again, to thank my panel for joining me uh, here today and, and, and hand it thank back you, to Susan. Thank you. Thank you.